A Cold Day, January 14th, 1987. A nondescript seven-story building in central Seoul near what is now Namyong Station. Dr. Oh Yon Sang was called in to help government officials revive a detainee being interrogated. He entered the tiny room and saw the body of a young man there lying motionless. He was young, a college student. He was wet and there was a tub of water. Dr. Oh immediately performed CPR on him for 30 minutes before giving up. He went outside and told the officers the young man had died. The officers rolled up the young man's blanket and threw it into an elevator. South Korea at the time was known internationally to torture political prisoners, but this time it turned out differently. Today on the Dark Side of Soul podcast, we talk about the death of Park Jung Chol and what led up to it and how it sparked the events that led to South Korea's democracy. And welcome to the Dark Side of Soul podcast. This is Joe. This is Sean. Thank you for joining us today on this huge topic. We, I feel too Peace. small to tackle. Mm, yeah, we're going to we're going to we're going to unintentionally leave out a lot. <laughs> for the record, this was Sean's idea. It but was. We're Sorry. gonna start. <laughs> um, so uh, we're gonna today. We're is gonna be the first part of our series. We're going to talk about the uh, uh, the June uprising, which led to uh, Korea's democracy, modern democracy, and mm. the the stories and the people behind it. And I think it's a story that needs to be told and retold. Um, before we start, though, I want to tell everyone that we do run regular tours. We are running the tours, even though, you know, you know, coronavirus, but we are being safe. Um, DarkSideOfSoul.com uh, to book your tour. We even have group discounts. Uh, also, follow us on our Facebook page at Dark Side of Soul. No, Facebook.com slash Dark Side of Soul. Just hunt Dark Side of Soul everywhere. Instagram, Facebook. We're um, there. Yeah, we're there. Um, uh, on the Facebook page, there. though, we have. Yes, that is true. The Facebook page, uh, as of this recording, has been getting a lot more activity lately, I've noticed. We've been getting a lot more um, new faces and, and combined with the veterans there. And it's getting really fun. We, uh, we regularly host, Sean regularly hosts horror movie watch parties. They're fun. And uh, you can even chat with Minji the Ghost on our messenger. She, she, she'll respond to you. And she even plays games with you. So go there for fun. Hmm. All right. So let's start with a little background about this. Um, so uh, after the Korean War, Oh my gosh, how far back are we going to go? Way back, well, there yeah. was this man yeah. called Dangun. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then you have to give his origin. It doesn't even and start. And then the time. dinosaurs came. Right, um, right. <laughs> that was a line from Airplane. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so Park Chung hee the, mm. the famous, we say, the big dictator, the big guy, mm. loved and reviled at the same time in history. Like, like many leaders and I would say a lot of Asian leaders. I mean, the the Yellow Emperor, uh, uh, Chen Shinwanji, Chen was mm -hmm. you know nasty guy, but is considered the great you know one of the great emperors of China. Um, yeah, even yeah, even in Europe, Vlad Sepish, he was the voivod of Wallachia yeah. in, uh, in the fifteenth century. He was nasty, impaled people. Yeah, and allegedly drank their blood. And but he's a he hero. Sort of. No, he didn't do that. I think. <laughs> Who knows? No, no, Who, knows? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? But he he came into power in the early sixties, um, and um, he he but he he had this determination to bring Korea out of South Korea, out of poverty. And to resist against uh, the North, which at the time was actively trying to take over South Korea. Mm -hmm. 
unlike now where it's just kind of a um, circle jerk, uh, <laughs> just trying to stay in power. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh gosh. We yeah. just, okay. Now we're going to have to put the explicit expletive label on our show for this episode. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> um, well, the, we, we have the warning on our tours themselves. So extend it to the podcast. 18 and, and over. Be- and it's because of me. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm nasty. I drop a couple left bumps. Uh, guys, I think in the past, that's fine. Yeah. Um, but anybody, when Park Day came into power, we just, the, the anniversary just passed the anniversary of the coup on May 16th. Ah, Ah. So let's move forward. Uh, so he's, he's, he's trying to stay in power because he does have this big long-term vision uh, of, you know, creating industries, heavy industries, uh, all these plans. Um, you know, this is when we see the rise of Samsung and Hyundai, all these guys. Uh, and uh, in uh, 1969, um, you know, he, he was trying to get a third term as president, but the Constitution didn't allow it. So he worked on amending it to allow for a third term. Then, 1972, he's reelected. And, uh, hold on. no, 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 no. Okay, see, there I go again. See, yeah. I'm getting my numbers confused. 1971, yeah. he's reelected. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Almost immediately declared a state of emergency based on the dangerous realities of the international situation, which kind of were true, but also, and man, such Kim Il Sung was such a convenient excuse for Park Chung Hee. He was the Joker to Park Chung Hee's Batman, and I wouldn't compare Park Chung Hee to Batman except in this case. <laughs> and you should explain Park Il uh, or, uh, Kim Il Sung. Kim Il Sung is a leader in North Korea. Yeah, at the time. Yeah, at the time, the the grandfather of Kim Jong Un. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, he did, uh, declare a state of emergency, uh, Park Chung-hee, like many dictators or wannabe dictators love declaring states of emergency to, to push things through. I mean, just, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, that was the whole plot of revenge of the Sith. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's a better comparison. Not Batman. Yeah. Park Chung-hee was, was, uh. Was uh, who was in? He was Palpatine. <laughs> he was Palpatine, but that would that would imply that he created Kim Il Sung to get himself mm. into power. <laughs> mm. Right. Uh huh. <laughs> it always comes back to Star Wars. Yes, it does. It does. <laughs> well, uh, in order to keep himself in power, in October 1972, he uh, performed what you could call kind of a self coup. Um. And yeah, it was did, an inter- internal coup. Yeah. Internal coup. He dissolved the National Assembly, just like the emperor dissolved the Senate at the beginning of A New Hope. <laughs> uh, suspended the Constitution, declared martial law, uh, closed the universities because dictators hate intellectuals. That is a consistent thing, even from uh, the Yellow Emperor uh, burning the scholars. Uh, <laughs> mm all the way up to, you know, Hitler killing burning, all the scholars and, and just, burning just books. Mm. dictators or people, authoritarians hate smart people. Mm. They don't, they don't like independent thinkers. They just don't like them. So close the universities, censor the press. Oh, they don't like free thought. They don't like people speaking restricted speech. Um, this is a common thing we see all throughout history with many different cultures. Mm-hmm. And so, um, he, he created, um, and he dissolved the constitution. Did you say at the time? In yes. October he dissolved 70, the constitution. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. The yeah. third Republic. Yeah. And so he, he created this, uh, special committee and, uh, they, they, they create something called the October Yushin constitution, uh, which, uh, it was Go passed ahead, in sorry. 19. Oh, sorry. It was passed in 1972. The, yeah. In November though, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. But it was, mm-hmm. it was known as the October you shouldn't. Oh, the yeah, the the actual the like the internal coup. Kind of, yes, yeah, okay, I but it was yeah, right. It was okay. This is shows a little bit of Park Chung Hee's past as a Japanese officer before mm-hmm. during World War Two. Um, uh, yes, because he patterned. There's more proof that he patterned the rise of Korea based on Japan, uh, because the Yushin is like the pr- Korean pronunciation of the Japanese word Ishin, which mm-hmm. means restoration, which is. 
the Meiji Meiji. Restoration, which has happened in the 19th century, which brought, which modernized Japan. Yeah. So for everyone listening, it's it's the same root characters, the same Chinese root characters. Yes. Like, I mean, we do this. We, in, in, in this part of the world, we, we, we have uh, lots. Of, we we say words just slightly differently, but we have the same Chinese root characters. For example, noodles in Korean is myon. You would say mm-hmm. in Chinese men in yen, and and in Japanese men as in ramen, ramyun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, mm-hmm. I'm going to talk about food too. <laughs> uh, um, so. Um, in this one, uh, he, he made sure that South Korean presidents were elected indirectly through an electoral college. Ooh, this sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> and this electoral college was handpicked by the presidential regime. Regime. This sounds right. very... Um, yeah. Uh, 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 this sounds very Putin right here. Um I'm not, no, no, don't, don't get, I'm not telling poutine, Sean. I know your Canadian ears were perked up when I said that. Mm. Putin, not poutine. <laughs> poutine. Yes. And uh, it called for, uh, uh, it had the, uh, this is what was interesting. Um, before then, the director of the Korean CIA uh, had gone to North Korea and met with Kim mm-hmm. Il-sung. Mm-hmm. And they started declaring, um, process for North and South uh, reunification. They were, they were actually declaring this. There's actually a symbolic phone line set up between Seoul and Pyongyang. That sounds familiar, doesn't it, Sean? Yes, it does. We just had that <laughs> recently, a couple of years ago. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yep. Yes. And just and like then, there was lots of enthusiasm. Mm-hmm. And so as under this, that under this environment that Park used this as an excuse to amend the constitution. Right. And so this handpicked regime was called the National Council for Unification. I can never say Huey, right. I'm always horrible with that. It's a tongue twister, I know. Yeah. Hey, hey, yeah. yeah, yeah. The ui, the ui hey, is hard hey. to hard to pronounce. Yeah. Yeah. I can, pr- I can pronounce them fine on their own, but if I'm reading them in a sentence, I always trip. That's why I say you're, you're a douchebag if you, if you poke fun at Asians for saying R's and L's, getting them mixed yeah. up, because we got exactly. that crap in Korean, too. It's hard. That's tough. Absolutely. It's tough. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so this, this National Council of Unification had two jobs, electing the president and putting in one third of the National Assembly. Right. Yeah. yeah. Because, you know, I think that was, uh, maybe that was North Korea. I mean, maybe they represent North Korea or something because they're planning on unifying. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I always always thought that where the president could appoint a third of the National Assembly meant that it gave him the legal opportunity to impose nepotism. Yeah. You just put whoever you wanted in power. So Yeah, like like, your your son-in-law. Or your daughter, okay. or, <laughs> or your daughter. Hmm. Hmm. Wonder. Oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, also in this, there are no presidential uh, term limits. So you can run, run for president. Even there's election every six years, but no, no term limits. And, oh, right. Yeah. The terms were six years. Then right? that was part of the Yushin. Yeah. S- single six year term, but no limit. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, allowed for this constant state of emergency. And in the state of emergency, during the state of emergency, pres- the person in power, the president in this case, was allowed to bypass the National Assembly. So just, I want this law passed. I want to, uh, I want to make marijuana illegal. Boom, did it because he didn't like all these folk musicians protesting him. And he's worried mm, that yeah. his son was getting into bad stuff or something like that. Um, yeah. Like Kim, uh, this quick. Kim Min Gi was the big folk singer at the time, who was one of the uh, the artists pushing back against the the the, the growth of power in, in the park government. Famous, yeah. Mm. And so um, he um, Park Chung Hee um, yeah gained power, but you know again, uh, Princess Leia says to Tarkin, you know the the tighter you you 
you the more you tighten your grip, the more systems that will fall through your fingers. Uh, uh, it 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 causes a little unrest. I hear you snickering. Yeah. <laughs> I hear you snickering. I think before you move on, though, I think it's I don't know if, you're, if you were thinking to mention it. The the um, when the Constitution was pushed through in seventy two in November, it was through a direct referendum, allegedly. Mm-hmm. And apparently the voter turnout was like 90 plus percent and the approval <laughs> rating was 90 plus percent. But it's argued that, you know, there was intimidation. Wow. Sounds like, sounds like a modern North Korean election. Mm, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. So 100 percent voted for Kim Jong-un. <laughs> wow. So. Wow, everybody did? Of course they did. Yeah. 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 So yeah, it got really unpopular. The Korean CIA, the the which yeah, uh, they're they're involved in this a lot. They're involved Mm -hmm. in everything up until pretty much the present day. They're involved in a lot of inner workings of South Korea. Um, there's a 1026 incident. Also, note this Mm -hmm. as well in Korean history. We like to name significant events by their date. Mm-hmm. The uh, you know, Samil, Samil, the 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 March first democracy movement. Samil. Mm-hmm. So this is the ten twenty six, and this incident happened on October twenty six, mm-hmm. in, in which um, Park Chung Hee is assassinated. It's an inside job. Mm-hmm. Th- that, that's not a conspiracy theory. Th- th- conspiracy theory. It's on. It's. It's on Wikipedia. It checks out. <laughs> Did you write the page? <laughs> you wrote, no you wrote longer. No longer. A little bit of trivia. In the early days of Wikipedia, I was basically the only person writing the Korean food section. And Ooh, I is think that some, right? I think some of my old digital camera photos of Emart's Naengmyeon still exist on Wikipedia as part of it. I wrote a few, just just quick, I wrote a few uh, articles about uh, some blues blues musicians that nobody ever really knew about, especially there's a guy. Going back uh, to our K-pop Car- episode. No, yeah, yeah. It, but Carrie Bell, an American uh, uh, harmonica, blues harmonica player. I started the page about him and that's, it just took off after that. I don't do anything on there anymore. I'm hard. Yeah, me too. Wikipedia. Me too. Yeah. It's yeah. Korean food just took off. I mean, it really was just one tiny page and now it's branched off into this giant right. octopus. Right. There you go. Mm. Delicious octopus. <laughs> so Pachang Hee is uh, assassinated. Mm. Um, mm. I think it's a prime minister. Uh, takes his, Whoever's designated to take over when the president dies, took over. That lasted six days. Then. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, before China. that, though, just quick, if if I could mention Joe, that uh, yeah, there there was a lot of growing uh, uh, hatred for Park Chung Hee. Although he was really popular in the '60s, but by the time Yushin came about, the start of the Fourth Republic, the new constitution that you're talking about, yeah, yeah, his popularity started to wane quite a bit, and there was a yeah. lot of dissent within the you know from the public, especially, um, and. Yeah, a lot of th- that was really when the student protesters started to, be- to become more active within the seventies. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, you mentioned like the, the the folk singers and stuff like that, who are still kind of national heroes in, in a lot of way. They were censored; their music wasn't allowed to be played. Uh, Marijuana maybe. is illegal. Marijuana is illegal. That's another episode we can talk about. Uh, <laughs> we can do in the future because uh, marijuana apparently it was pretty common here in the in the 60s among performers um so that got cracked down on mm-hmm. um but yeah the the proletariat the working class really started to uh fight against Pak Jung Hee and in August 79 so several months before Pak was assassinated there was about 200 or so women who worked in a textile factory uh for uh for YH company, YH trading company, can't quite remember the company's name. They they staged a protest against against the government, and uh, the police broke it up. Got very violent, and um, just two hundred, yeah, just two hundred. Yeah, rough, roughly roughly two hundred. You didn't want to been in Korea and those two hundred. That's that's hardly an outing. That, that's yeah, exactly. You can, yeah, you can see two hundred people on the summit 
of some of the mountains at a single time. Yeah, pro- protesting is a national pastime. That is right. a small protest. Goes way back at least to the 12th century, uh, the protesting in Korean culture, in Korean okay. history, I should say. Yeah. Um, but yeah, these 200 uh, textile workers, all women, protested. And one of them died, at least one died, uh, from a fall. But they oh. don't know. They don't know if she was pushed or she committed suicide. She's the Crispus addicts of that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, a lot of the... the and I think that this is important too. What we're going to eventually get to the the June uprising, the June struggle, is that it was really in the seventies after the establishment of the Fourth Republic of the Yushin Constitution that protesting really became a subculture. It became a counterculture essentially, mm-hmm. and a lot of people, even we talked about a little bit in the K-pop episode, how music is always on. It's right in the core. It's the mainstream. Mm. There's very little that's popular within the fringe, but there there are there there have been subcultures all throughout Korean history, yeah. and in the '70s, that protest culture was really a counterculture of its own, and um, a lot of famous people who eventually went on to become leaders, like Kim Dae Jung, they were part of that. Now he wasn't a he was a young man, but he wasn't a, a very young person at the time. Um, but yeah, the protest subculture. We most was mostly the artists and things like that, like we talked with the singers. So and youth had that's vibrancy important. and democracy had vibrancy. It was coming, and that's oh my god! Am I going to get on this soapbox about my, this is my big thing? Trouble with some a lot of mainstream K-pop is, um, you know, music has especially youth music has usually been a way of protesting or countering. The, the establishments of authority the of your parents' generation. Right. And it kind of scares me that that the current mainstream K-pop is actually supported by the government. It's government-sponsored music. No, that's what we have to say. It's corporate. It's well, it's corporate, corporate, but it's also the government sponsors it. Right, right, right. Exactly. They, yeah. they, they actually pay for, for these guys to be promoted. And mm-hmm. yeah. For the longest time, on uh, at the uh, on the outside of the Korean Tourism Organization's building, uh, headquarters in Seoul, just on the Cheonggyecheon stream, um, there was a big poster of some K-pop band. I don't know who it was, but it but they were there on a billboard promoting tourism to Korea from the Korean Tourism Organization, so which is a government organization, so completely... No, but completely there's financed. actually like funds that are yes. channeled into the industry to right. promote it as... <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so, go to our K-pop episode. It's, it's good because we admittedly, we do like some of it, but we also have a lot of suggestions for many artists that don't get enough play that are so interesting. Anyway... All right, and none of that existed in the seventies because they were they were rebellion, re, uh, rebellious musicians at that time. K-pop was music of rebellion. Yeah, in the seventies. Mm-hmm. Not not now. Not now. No. Like I mean, occasionally you find like rappers. It's usually in rappers that you'll find mm-hmm. uh, a lot of that, a lot of uh, protest um, in hip hop. Park's assassination, six days, his predecessor is in office, and then the military junta. Uh, Chung Doo-won comes to power, uh, rolls in with the military, um, and then uh, he takes a, he, he's trying to grab hold of the power. I think, it's, I think it's kind of tenuous at the time, but he works on establishing himself as the main authority. Uh, 1980, there's a new constitution. Oh my gosh, how many constitutions are we going to have? Um, <laughs> president can only serve one seven-year term. So it, it's, it, so, the, uh, so in this sense, yeah. So it, it's, Chung Doo-won is still kind of authoritarian. I, I kind of call him Pak Chung-hee light. Mm-hmm. But he's still kind more of... More violent, too. Yeah, <clears throat> he's more violent. But... Um, he still kind of tries in letter spirit, no, in letter uh, to to follow the constitution. Mm-hmm. But he, he Putinizes it. <laughs> I would say <laughs> he's more of a Putin character. I would say, right? 
<laughs> oh gosh, we're gonna we're gonna get poisoned, aren't we, Sean? Um, well, you said it, not me. <laughs> okay. Um. So he didn't really change the constitution much. He but he did he did also didn't open his regime. Um. We uh, the Korean public's not standing for this. They're they're not stupid. Uh, they, they, they just see, okay, we just have a different emperor now. We don't want an emperor. We want democracy, um, which led to, uh, uh, the Gu- Guangzhou uprising, which led, which became the Guangzhou massacre in 1980, mm-hmm. May of 1980. We just passed the 40th anniversary of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, Guangzhou was like a part of, it's, it's just part of a series of democratic movements uh, after Park Chung Hee's assassination, um, numbers are still debated to this day of how many people died in the Guangzhou massacre. The official number—I I don't know—I'm hearing it's around two thousand people were killed. The official, isn't it? Isn't it two hundred for the official? I think the official. Yeah, two hundred. Maybe, maybe the 200. government. Yeah, but it's, it's yeah. approximated by scholars as two thousand people died. Yeah, yeah, I've read people at the people who were there who still speak about it they say there was easily more than 200 people dead and that they saw so and we're not going to talk too much about this because we're going to save this for another episode of the guangxi massacre mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah so but uh anyway and just quick to go back when when chun duan chun duan took power that happened on december 12th so that's called the 1212 incidents. So going back to your point a few minutes ago that <laughs> these incidents and these events and these uprisings are often named after the dates that they occurred on um, that one as well. And that it must was, be uh, so yeah. easy for Korean students to memorize dates. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, Oh, we have to memorize 1066, but right. it's not in when the When did the reign of terror start? Uh, yeah. When was the, when was the uh, when was you know when did the the attack on Bastille take it's, place? It's like uh, when did the ten twenty six incident start? <laughs> you're right. <laughs> <laughs> twelve twelve nineteen seventy nine. <laughs> so yeah, and I think it's also important to point out that Chen Duan was buddies with Pak Chung Hee, and he was the head of the um, uh, Army Security Council. They go re- way back to with No Teu and all those guys. They were all so. He's the Darth Vader, and that's right. He's behind the assassination, maybe. Yep, <laughs> that's right. Go this. So, yeah, Darth Vader talking. killed the Emperor. <laughs> you know, it's yep. second hand man. That's uh, right. <laughs> just I'm, I'm I'm pushing this all the way. I'm squeezing it out. Keep going. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so then yeah, so Kwangju happened. Um, Still yeah, Guangzhou happened. Um, uh, the government, uh, Chun Duan painted it as, as it was a plot by communist sympathizers. It, mm-hmm. It's kind of like, um, I, tell me if I'm off by this, but it's kind of how Beijing um, uh, 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 has painted Tiananmen Square. Hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, anti anti nationalists and as in as yeah, in sure. they kind of covered it up as if it really didn't happen. For the longest time, yeah, they yeah. did. Yeah, and it, well, it's still being talked about. Chun Duan, just recently, there was some release of papers about that. Chun Duan uh, communicated with, with the United States right around the time after, I think it was. This is recent information. Um, but yeah, it, for the longest time, it was, it was a massive cover-up. Yeah. So... Uh, and then taking a page out of the Park Chung Hee playbook in 1985, Chen Duan staged uh, some elections that kind of try to look, he's trying to make himself look legit. Hmm. We don't know how, um, I think this is when uh, the West, the West that was the supporting South Korea was starting to look critically after Guangzhou. I think the West was starting to uh, be a little more critical of South Korea and started examining it a little more about its electioneering and everything. Well, at the same time, stuff was happening in South America and a lot of this. Crap. So Chun Duan was kind of looked like the same way that in the 80s, a lot of South American dictators were looked at, mm-hmm. you know, um, trying to do elections. And it kind of, Chun Duan was trying to look legit, but it kind of backfired on him because uh, it brought into more prominence uh, Two, two of his big op- became his, his two big oppositions, uh, Kim Yong Sam and Kim Dae Jung. Um, 
and uh, they they came into power and and they wanted they they became part of this movement demanding direct presidential elections. Get rid of that electoral college, handpicked by the president. <laughs> and yep. so Chandu Wan uh, did this act of, and we've seen this happen so many times in Korea. Uh, but, um, Delay tactics. Oh, yeah, sure. Of course we will do this. Oh, but we need to create a committee. <laughs> and, you know, we don't have time to do this while you debate this in the committee. Um, oh, more Star Wars. Um, <laughs> uh, and so uh, and, and we had the Olympics, the 1980 Olympics, 1988 Olympics coming up. So, of course, I mean, why, why create a state of emergency when you have the Olympics coming up? What a great excuse to suspend talks about democracy. Mm. So uh, he, he created a parliamentary committee to discuss direct all the, all these, uh, all these uh, demands that the opposition had and, and, and then suspended the committee committee in April 13th, 1987. Oh, we're leading up to something here. Mm-hmm. We're leading up to this uh, now a little bit before this. Uh, well, this is, this intensified the restlessness and small protest occurred. Now this leads us to Pak Chung Chuk. Um, now at the time, um, in, in a Putin-esque type of way, Chun Duan was wanting to install his handpicked successor, No Teu. Uh, no Teu, remember a while back, Putin was in power, but he was limited and he had term limits and he had to leave power. And I forget the guy's name, but he put in a temporary president who basically rubber stamped everything Putin did until Putin came back into power. <laughs> <laughs> mm. uh, I think Kim Dae Jung, I mean, not Kim Dae Jung, Chun Doo was planning to do the same thing, just insert his little puppet and bring himself back into power. Who knows? Or, you know, just kind of do things his way. So, um, starting off with uh, Pak Chung Chol was a student at uh, Seoul National University who was a linguistics student. Um, after Guangzhou, and this is why we mentioned Guangzhou and all this. He became an activist after Guangzhou. Um, oh, he's part of that. I think he wasn't in college <laughs> at the time. No, of no, he was—he was a young man. Yeah, yeah he was yeah. a much younger man. Mm. Well, well, not a young man. He was a kid. Yes, right. It was, I mean, it was, yeah. it was maybe in high school. Yeah, yeah. I'm not really sure how old. Yeah, uh, I, well, my he guessing. Uni- he was. I think he was born in '65. I need to double check that. Yeah, yeah, he he was he was a teenager. Yeah, he you was know, during during Guangzhou. Yeah, this is what gets me when I was researching this again is as I realized he's not much older than we were. He's not much older than us, just by a decade. So who was sorry? Who was Park Chung Chol? Park. Oh, okay. Not much older not, than we. Yeah, no, not Chun Du Wan. Yeah, yeah, no, that, <laughs> at, Well, at the yes, at the t- not, at the time. No, 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 no. Park Chung Chol now. Is yeah, he was born in 65. Yes, yes. Mm. We're, I was born in 74. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's that much older than, I mean, just a decade older than me. He'd be in his 50s now. Right. Which, um, uh, people under 30, 30 or uh, uh, 50 ain't that old. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, uh, right. Uh, mm. Until you become 50, and I'm like, oh, crap. So uh, he was part of this uh, activist group. Uh, they were really after this big head honcho and this activist activist group at Seoul National University. And remember what we've said before: uh, di- authoritarians hate intellectuals. They they hate they they hate colleges because intellectuals and students uh, tend tend to be a little more active in these things because their their brains are really uh, getting fertilized. <laughs> You could say mm-hmm. <laughs> by Correct. new thoughts. Um, and so anyway, um, uh, they was part of this activist group and they wanted this big guy. And so they were able to nab Pak Chung Chuk, but they really wanted uh, another leader of, of this activist group. So mm-hmm. um, they did what they usually did. They, 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 they took it to be tortured. And this is a building it still exists, and we're going to talk a bit, a bit more about this in the next episode. But it's it's in uh, it's right in outside, right outside Namyong Station, which is near Sukmin 
Sung Young uh, uh, Women's University, which is near. Oh my gosh! If you know the if you know the layout of Seoul, uh, if you know where Samgakji and the war the Korean War Memorial Museum is, which is right near Itaewon in Yongsan Army Base, um, it's around there. It's it's all around there. Um, there, I, I have this. If you've taken the Dark Side of Seoul tour, I give everyone a map of my research map, and I've even pegged a lot of the places where they tortured people uh, during this regime. And a lot of it's on the northern foot of of a uh, Namsan Mountain, um, and and it's you can walk around there, and it, it's pristine. A lot of uh, wealthy people live there now. And it's a gorgeous area, but yeah, a lot of dark stuff happened there and people just didn't know that. And so there's this nondescript building right outside of Nam Young Station. Um, and we'll talk about that because I have a surprise for you about that, where, where uh, they, they took him to in a tiny interrogation room. Um, he wouldn't confess. He wouldn't tell where this other activist was. So they water, basically waterboarded him. They took a tub. And they shoved his head several times into the tub. Um, in the process, you know, they, they thought that maybe he was uh, maybe l- drowning or maybe it was water. But in the autopsy, it was found that, uh, that he was suffocated because uh, a knee was pressed up against his throat. and uh, Crushed his throat. Crushed his throat. Um, and that brings us back to Dr. Oh Young San finding him mostly naked in a freezing room. This is in January, remember, January 14th, 1987. Um, and we know how cold before global warming really took in, <laughs> how cold Seoul's winters could be. Um, and this was the anti communism bureau building. Um, and he was just lying there motionless and um, 30 minutes. Dr. Oh Yun Sang, as I mentioned at the opening, uh, was, was tried to do CPR and gave up after 30 minutes. Um, January 15th, um, this started. This started. This started leaking about his death because it started leaking that 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 the young man had died, and it became very questionable. The the the, the journal, the newspapers were already digging in, trying to trying to trying to find wrongdoings by the government. And other organizations as well, and uh, they they went and accosted Dr. O on the next day, January fifteenth, and all he said to the press was, "There was a tub. I heard bubbles pop inside his lungs. The floor was wet." Didn't say any more. It almost sounded like a haiku. <laughs> How many syllables? This kind of thing. I'm not counting, but it just it almost sounds like a haiku. Mm. Um, of course, the reporters felt that there was there was more. He was he was grilled by police and prosecutors for nearly twenty hours. Um, later on, uh, Doctor O said, uh, "I never intended to speak out for democracy. As a doctor, is my duty to talk candidly about my patients' conditions." And so, um, afterward, this information was suppressed by the government um, about how the body was, uh, how how uh, Park was killed or how he died, I didn't say he was killed. Um, Hwang, uh, Hwang Jok Jun uh, performed the autopsy. He was a uh, forensics investigator. He performed the on- autopsy, and uh, he, 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 the, he was pressured by the police to say he died from shock in the heart, like it was a natural condition, mm-hmm. uh, from shock. And he refused, and he said he suffocated due to neck pressure, uh, which um, one of the prosecutors involved in this, uh, he was actually, I think he was on the, bad guy's side um at first um uh he was uh he was he was part of the government cover-up but he was told by the police to immediately cremate park's body to hide the evidence um when he first saw the body he could instantly tell he was tortured and he refused to comply uh somehow this information landed in the hands of representative e bu young Li Bu Yong, who was at the present time in jail for leading an anti-government rally the year earlier in May 1986. May is a very significant year in Korean politics, by the way, Korean political history. Uh, It keeps coming up. Uh, While in prison or in jail, 
uh, he, he wrote a letter uh, disclosing what was happening. Uh, he convinced two prison guards to help him get it out. It was passed to a third guard, and it landed in the hands of the Korean Catholic Church two months afterward. So this would be around March uh, 1987. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in May 1987, during a commemoration for the Gwangju Uprising, Father Kim Sung Hun uh, read it during the ceremony, read this letter during the ceremony. And this is what was leading up to June 1987. Now, historically, now Sean, maybe you could back me up on this or refute me. Please feel free mm-hmm. to refute me. But this is just this is my personal observation. <laughs> okay. It, it is like the Korean Catholic Church just has historically been pro-democracy since they entered Korea. This is why the Chosun era, uh, the Chosun, uh, the Confucians and everyone did not really aggressively suppress the Catholic Church coming into Korea. Because it was, I don't want to say Western ideals, but it was outside ideals that promoted democracy. They felt that was very dangerous. And so it seems like... It they seems saw, like yeah, they thought it was dangerous, yes. It mm-hmm. seems to me that the Catholic church in Korea had always found its way into a lot of these struggles. And, and I think also the, um, and the uh, 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 colonial struggles, uh, freeing Korea from Japan uh, during the, during, during uh, from 1905 to 1945 uh, was, was sort of, off. I remember Japan was trying to suppress the Catholic church then too, because it was part of that. <sighs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, and then the Catholic Church witnessed its own persecution when it first entered Korea, and for quite some time, up until especially culminating in the the executions of uh, French Catholic priests in the 1860s. Mm-hmm. So, um, our, fr- our big friend, the uh, Taewon Gun. Yeah. Yes, our buddy, the. Uh, the day one gun. Uh, yeah. So that, yeah, they definitely experienced their own persecution in Korea. Not only the, the, the Western initially, mostly French missionaries, but the, also the Koreans who converted. So not only were the, not only were the, the French priests executed in the 1860s, which um, led to a lot for, of things. <laughs> yes. Uh, that we're still we dealing with today. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, uh, but a lot of the Koreans who converted and converted secretly because conversion was uh, frowned upon. And so historically, the Korean Catholic Church had had a subversive role mm-hmm. yeah. during yeah. all this time. It's, it's, it's unsung. It's really not many people know about this. Mm-hmm. Um, and and uh, I mean, I'm not like trying to promote it. I mean, I am a recovering Catholic myself. <laughs> I don't drink or swear enough to be really Catholic. So. <laughs> oh, I, I, we come, I come from a family of Mardi Gras Catholics. They, they drink. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm newfie Irish Catholic. So yeah, <laughs> lots of swearing and drinking. I think they swear in church. <laughs> oh, stories I have. Um, interesting. Interesting. The dark side of Joe. Uh, <laughs> Next episode. <laughs> um, I, but I just really find that the more I read, and, and just and when I was just setting up the research for this show, it's like again the Catholic Church popped up, mm-hmm. and it's, it's it, I'm just finding these themes again, and I just it's this is why I love this history so much. It's so fascinating, mm-hmm. these people and these themes that just keep popping up over and over again, and and so that's why I'm pointing this out. It's like wow, this is a pattern we have again of the Catholic Church getting involved, and you see this alliance forming. This this is kind of like okay now we're in Star Wars Rebels territory so you got to watch that show uh, <laughs> these disparate elements including I mean if, if you're following Star Wars former Imperials or things like that getting involved in this of so another prosecutor part of the government uh, this part of the establishment uh, Lee Hong Kyu um, he's he he leaked this to a Jungang Ilbo reporter Shin Sung Ho. Uh, even though he was, they were, all the prosecutors were on lockdown. They, they were ordered not to leak anything, um, keep everything tight. Of course, some people have a conscience, and uh, Lee Hong Kyu was brave enough to, to do this. I mean, this is very risky. I mean, this, is, this isn't, you know, in, in modern days, you would kind of just get a slap and, 
you know, they'll, they'll try to just defame you in some way. But in the, back in those days, you could go to jail, tortured, and mysteriously, your autopsy would say you had shock of the heart. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, you would disappear back in those days. So it was very risky to do that. So gave it to a uh, reporter, Shin Sung Ho, who at the time, when he got this news and started digging into this, hold himself up in a motel near his office because didn't dare go home for fear that he would get kidnapped by the authorities. And then, uh, so we have this alliance between the Catholic Priest Association for Justice, CPAJ, this Dr. Oh Yon Sang, um, prosecutor, the prosecutors I mentioned, and journalist Shim Sung Ho, they all work together to exhume this cover-up on May 18th, and this got reported in the Jungling Elbow, and it totally inflamed the, pro- the public. And the CPA- CPAG planned this demonstration against the government for June 10th, 1987. And I think we're going to say next time. On Dark Side of Soul mm. podcast, <laughs> we're mm. gonna we're gonna talk about what this did. There's even more. There is so much more. I mean, you thought. I mean, this is one death. This is one death of a student that's that started this, but it leads to more tragedy. It leads to mm. more hope. It leads to more just dramatic struggle in this one yeah. this amazing country. Um, yeah. Please, please stay tuned for the next part of our cover coverage of the yeah. June uprising. Yeah. One last thing I'd say for this episode, and I think it's important to point out, is the are, are the protesters themselves by the 1980s after Yushin, after the establishment of um, the restoration of the constitution. U- yeah, right. Of the Yushin Constitution, the Fourth Republic, in 1972, then up, then at post the assassination of Park Chung Hee in '79, the protesters who were protesting in the 80s during the the Chunduan era, they experienced an ideological shift. Mm-hmm. They weren't really influenced by the Korean War anymore. Um, they weren't influenced by the Yushin uh, or the like the the um, uh, the April Revolution right. uh, in 1960. Um, they were mostly influenced by the failure to achieve reform after Park Jung Hee was assassinated. This is what we would call, and and we would call the baby boomers, but in Korea they're known as the three eight six generation. Right, right, that's right. So yeah, the, the, there was this massive ideological shift, and they weren't even really concerned. I think a lot of people could argue they weren't even really concerned with liberal democracy anymore where they previously, they saw liberal democracy as a means to achieve not only reform within South Korea, but also reunification of the Koreas. Mm -hmm. So they weren't even particularly concerned with that anymore. They, they had, they had more pressing matters that, 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 uh, that they thought were more pressing matters that previous generations of protesters didn't consider. Mm -hmm. Um, so there was this massive shift. Um, yeah, so they saw the problems in Korea to be inherently a part of the socio-political system that existed in Korea at the time. And that's what needed to change. And this is what we're going to talk about in the next show. We're going to mm-hmm. talk a lot about this aftermath. And this was not just a governmental movement. This was in many different sectors of society. This was an uprising for different sectors of uprooting, I would say, the old colonial slash Confucian systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, just to say quick on that as well, the idea of neocolonialism of the United States, that's what the protesters viewed the United States as a massive part of the problems within Korea. Right. And that's really the beginning of a lot of the Yankee go home and the uh, the anti-Americanism uh, that you can still see through some uh, lines of, of le- leftist thinking in Korea today. Because yeah, really because kind of, um, the American military was implied into the Gwangju massacre. That's right, mm-hmm. and also with the uh, uh, with the establishment of Park Chung Hee, that JFK if not, supported the coup. 
Yeah, but if not participating in the Guangzhou massacre, of, of at least turning a blind eye to it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They were tolerant of it. Yeah. In the in the at the very least. That's yeah. right. Because we got to so, fight the commies. We got to fight them commies. Yeah. 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 So. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Next time, talk very specifically as much as we can too about the the protesters. Yes. That's something I'm always interested in. I got got some. St- Big stories coming up. Well, anyway, thank you for joining us today. Um, mm. uh, John, Sean, tell us about uh, Matt Shore. Matt, yes, my buddy Matt. Um, so a f- close friend of mine uh, named Matt Shore is also a comic book writer like myself. And uh, he has a new comic book coming out. He's writing a comic book series uh, called Moby Dick Back from the Deep. It's a horror comic series. And it's about Moby Dick coming back as a zombie. Oh, my goodness. Uh, and I'll just read quick the description that Matt has for Got to hear this. I got to hear this. Okay. Moby Dick, back from the deep, tells the story of the legendary white whale reappearing in modern times and wreaking havoc on anyone unlucky enough to be in its way. So there you go. Zombie Moby Dick. I may be out of line for for pondering this, but if if they say that... Moby, the original Moby Dick was a parable for impotence. Are they? Is this implying that the re-rise is like the Viagra? There you go. Of Moby Dick. See, we're talking about all these rises, right? Yeah. The rising, the rising of the proletariat in Korea, the rising of Moby Dick, the rising of <laughs> Dick. Uh, uh, what are you talking about, Joe? What are you getting on with? Hey, we thought it was we dead. Say back, it's rising we say again. We say back home in Newfoundland, what are you getting on with, boy? Lord Jesus. <laughs> Zombie Moby Dick. That sounds it's awesome. I've yeah, it's great. It's a great series. Really yeah. So issue three. So if everyone's in, yeah. Oh, awesome. And, and, and also mm-hmm. remind you, we are doing the Dark Side of Soul tours at darksideofsoul.com. Stay tuned on that one. We're thinking of doing some special stuff with the tour. So if you want to, I mean, actually just join our Facebook page. Uh, participate in that and you can get news that way it's an easy way to do that um, also uh, we thank you for Sodak Sun for give, lending us the music mm-hmm. um, Sean where we can find Sodak Sun I need to write that down in our notes yeah well, it's uh, Bandcamp he's on, on Bandcamp Band yeah yep and we release I, I'm, um, I'm on Bandcamp and I, I'm subscribed to Sodak Sun so yes yes yeah uh, it, Jeju if you go to Bandcamp search uh, Jeju Digital that's the name of the uh, label yeah, and then Digi you can find uh, all the albums that are released, not only by Sodak Sound, but some other artists, uh, produ- music producers. Uh, but you'll find the album there called When Tigers Smoked Pipes. And that album has our the song that we use as our theme song for the right. podcast and the, the track that I use for the theme of Weird Tales from Korean Lore. Right. Which reminds us, uh, you know, if you want to help support the show and get lots of extra stuff, join mm. uh, our Patreon at patreon.com slash dark side of soul. And uh, we have ranges from $5 a month to $20 a month. Uh, you get extras. You get Sean's extra weird, weird tales. Mm-hmm. Yes, which I just listened to the latest one. So good. Mm-hmm. And and you know you get you get more of Sean's voice, which I guess <laughs> to Sean's voice. Uh, <laughs> bless Joe. <laughs> uh, and plus, you uh, at different tiers, you can get more music by Sodak Sun. And if you get the top tier, you uh, even get uh, well. We do a monthly get together on Zoom with all of our top tier Come, patrons. Coming up this Saturday, our next yeah. one. Yep, and. And you get uh, swag uh, mailed to your house, special uh, monthly swag, and uh, you get mentioned at the end of our show. So we'd like to thank our top tier <laughs> patrons, Angel Earl, Joel Bonomini. See, I've tried different ways. <laughs> Joel told me he doesn't even know how to pronounce his last name. So <laughs> Bonomini, Bonomini. Bonomini, but yeah, yes. Bonomini. Joel Bono. I like that. Joel Bonamini. Joel Bono. If Joel, if Joel starts a band, he's got to be the lead singer and he's got to go by Joel Bono. But he'd go by the mini Bono. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to peg Bono. Joel. I'm going to peg Joel on the next, on the next get together. 
Yeah, don't uh, forget. Ja- Jamie Staley and Sheridan Cullen. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Yes, thank you. And it's funny. It's like, I mean, we mentioned these guys, but, but really our patrons, they're, they're our friends. They've become our friends over the over mm. all this time. And we just we just hang out at the Facebook group and the Facebook page and, and we just, just have fun. Drink and chat. Yeah, we talk yeah. about uh, dark stuff, supernatural stuff, history. Um, we ask their opinions on the on the podcast and weird tales from Korean lore. Just hear Maybe a, a fellow ideas had a better at all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Sean. Thanks, oh Joe. man, this felt good. I can't wait mm. for the next show. All right, mm. yeah, guys. Until next time, stay spooky. Good night. Mm-hmm.